An investigation sparked by a whistleblower. I saw a lot of papers. And I saw one that really troubled me. Shattered survivors. Ah, they broke in her spirit again. Several investigations, one lawyer guilty. There was almost a million dollars that survivors were entitled to that they didn't receive. Residential school settlement agreement at risk. For residential school survivors across Canada, the process of being compensated for physical and sexual abuse stirs up feelings of shame and pain. It means revealing dark and sometimes shocking details to strangers in order to get money from the very government that sent them to the schools in the first place. It's a complex process involving lawyers at every level, and it's created anger among some survivors who say it's attracting people who are taking advantage of them all over again. APTN investigates Kathleen Martins is back with a second look at the independent assessment process. Remember this elder? Annie, how old were you when you went to residential school? Five. And how long were you there? Ten years. We told you about Annie Plume's failed application for compensation last fall. The Blood Tribe member was denied compensation for permanent injuries she insists she suffered at Indian Residential School. It's something she should have been entitled to under the Independent Assessment Process, or IAP. Do, does your ear work now? My date taps are good. It's not really good, not very good. Her family blames her Calgary law firm, Blot and Company, for not arranging for the Blackfoot interpreter she needed. The foul up angered her chief and nephew, Charles Weaselhead. A year ago, he alerted Chief Adjudicator Daniel Ish and Assembly of First Nations National Chief Sean Atlio to his serious concerns about the law firm telling them first individual claimants may not be receiving the financial compensation to which they are entitled. Second, claimants, many of whom already suffer from disadvantages, are not being heard in the assessment process and there is thus no real healing for them through the IAP. The chief says he received letters back but no concrete action was taken. It appeared to him his aunt's law firm had too many clients and did not prepare properly so that Annie could have the support she needed for her hearing. She went in there, they refused a translator to come in with her, they refused uh, some kind of support, you know, person to be with her, whether it was one of her children or one of uh, a person that she trusts, you know, that she would be in there with, you know. It wasn't the only time officials were made aware of complaints against Blot and Company well before a judge ordered a formal investigation last November. Sadly, Annie was sick when she spoke to us and died that month before her story aired and cases were put under review. But it was complaints from blood survivors that convinced B.C. Supreme Court Justice Brenda Brown to order the probe of Blot and Company files and Honor Walk, the form-filling company that worked with the Calgary law firm. The judge ordered an investigation into allegations that the companies worked together to recruit and overcharge survivors in an alleged scheme that violates IAP rules. In our special report last November, we showed that Honor Walk charged survivors $4,000 to fill out compensation forms and Blot and Company deducted the amount from their payments. We also showed you that survivors were offered loans and big screen TVs through Blot and Company or Honor Walk before their compensation arrived and how as much as 30% interest was charged on the loans and the cost of electronics was deducted from their checks. A no-no under the IAP. A former Honor Walk manager in Saskatoon helped us. That's Honor Walk, that's Blot & Company. Kelly Bush also had concerns about how Honor Walk and Blot & Company were treating survivors in northern Saskatchewan. She complained to the Law Society of Alberta and has cooperated with the court's investigation. She isn't the only one to stick her neck out. Joanne Hansen put her professional ethics and reputation as a registered social worker on the line way before the court got involved. So I kept hearing this, so you can go to the Law Society, oh well, yeah, okay. I'd gone even to the RCMP. I'd gone to every line of defense that I knew of at the time. Uh, Every one of them. And? Nothing. There was nothing. There was no, there was no recourse. There's nothing. Hansen works with survivors from the Blood Reserve. 
providing counseling by referral. She says she was an employee of Honor Walk and provided support for their clients. People we showed you in our first story, Doris Bird, Aaron Tallow, Marie Goodrider, and of course, Annie Plume. She became my friend. I asked her family if they would ask her because she was old and very ill. You know, is she up to having an interview with APTN? And uh, they asked her, and she said yes, without a doubt. And she went there, and I was there. And then at the end, which you didn't catch on camera, and I'll never, and this picture is what I saw. She looked up at me and she says, if this can help one elder, then it's worth it for me. Hansen told us Annie said she felt the need to talk about how a process that was supposed to help her heal instead hurt her all over again. And it was nothing to do with money for Annie. All it was, she'd tell me this over and over and over again. I just want to tell my story. After years of complaining without a response from the authorities, Hansen launched her own investigation. Hansen questioned people, copied documents, and recorded conversations. She shared them with APTN Investigates last spring, after two years of fruitlessly complaining through regular channels. I asked the Secretariat's office and, and Dan Ish's office, you know, come and see this. The Secretariat's office was the one that said, said to me, uh, well, what do you know? And I said, well, you know what I know. You've seen the files. She was critical of what she saw as the lack of interest by a member of Ish's staff. He said, well, I'm not sending anybody to that. I'm not doing that. And I said, well, then what are you doing? You know, and I actually asked him, so what kind of office do you have? And he says, well, I have a nice office with a window view. And I says, well, how much are you getting paid? <laughs> and he said, well, that's, I'm not at liberty to tell you or whatever. I can't remember exactly what he said. And I said, so you're telling me that you can't send somebody to southern Alberta when there's all this money for your wages. She says other frontline workers on the reserve shared her concerns. Together they saw survivors lose large amounts of their compensation payout to legal and other fees. They watched them wait years to hear from and meet their lawyers, sometimes not until the morning of their compensation hearings. They were told sometimes a different lawyer would show up with files that were incomplete or incorrect and they discovered clients weren't properly prepared for the emotional hearings and the trauma they created. What their concerns were that they weren't getting, seeing their, their lawyers, they never got to see their applications, um, you know, stuff like that, the details. I phoned the Law Society myself and they said they wouldn't take a report to me, from me, because it would be third party reporting. But t they encouraged me to, to write a report and I did but I didn't send it in because then I called him, well, what happens to this report? It just goes to Mr. Blot. So why would I do that? APTN Investigates again requested interviews with Blot, who did not respond, and Honor Walk President Tom Denom. Denom did offer to supply a written statement, but never did. We wanted to hear from the Assembly of First Nations and arranged an interview with its lawyer, Kathleen Mahoney. She is also a member of the IAP Oversight Committee. But Mahoney changed her mind, saying the AFN would comment once the judge's report was made public. There's a lot at stake for the AFN. Its former leader, Phil Fontaine, sued the federal government to establish the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. That leveraged billions of dollars to create compensation services for survivors, including the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It also, Fontaine announced in this letter, put the IAP in place of an Alternative Dispute Resolution, or the ADR, that produced many complaints about lawyers overcharging clients. Blot has 3,000 IAP clients. If the investigation shows that many were not properly represented, it could be expensive to fix. A precedent may have been set in Manitoba last month in terms of how expensive. That's when Winnipeg lawyer Howard Tenenhouse was disbarred for overcharging 54 survivors. He pleaded guilty to, among other things, taking the full 30% in fees when adjudicators disallowed it. So in this particular case, there was almost a million dollars that um, survivors were entitled to that they didn't receive. 
The Law Society of Manitoba says in one instance, Tenenhouse House went to great lengths to get the money, accompanying one survivor to a bank and demanding he deposit funds in the lawyer's wife's account. Feinblit says Tenenhouse House is the first lawyer in Canada to lose his license for financially abusing vulnerable survivors. It's a penalty that is reserved for the most serious type of conduct. Feinblit says Tenenhaus was caught because survivors filed complaints, and so did Daniel Ish. Tenenhaus was ordered to repay his clients, but because that may take time, the Law Society has already cut the checks and intends to recoup the money from its disbarred member. If we didn't recover anything from uh, uh, Mr. Tenenhaus, then we would be out of pocket, but it's our responsibility, we think, and I think it's unique to the legal profession, that if, uh, if one lawyer who turns out to be a bad apple steals, every other lawyer will pay it back. The allegations against Blot and Company and Honor Walk have not been proven. The court-ordered investigation is complete, but the findings have not been made public. Yet the Law Society of Alberta won't confirm it's conducting its own investigation into Blot and Company. Despite the fact that its investigator requested an interview with the executive producer of our show, which did not take place. It looks like the legal community's disciplinary system is working. That lawyers in the residential school compensation process who don't follow the rules are being rooted out. Or are they? Stay tuned for part two.